I don't think a lot of people, and particularly the norm, is very in tune with just the reactive or kind of the passive inputs that they have on a day-to-day -day basis and how it affects the way that they think and feel and perform. Hey everybody, welcome to the Live Your Legacy podcast. The goal of our show is to help you live your own legacy by connecting you to people and concepts that have made a tremendous impact on the lives of others. Today's legacy guest is the number one best-selling author, keynote speaker, and big performance consultant for businesses, organizations, entrepreneurs, and teams. He is the founder of Outperform the Norm, a leading program for business leaders and athletes driven to raise their game and perform at the highest level. This guy has nine best-selling books, articles, podcasts, and online programs that inspire hundreds of thousands of people around the world with one common goal, to outperform. He has also a master's degree in sports psychology and serves on advisory committees of three national level organizations. This guy is also one craziest beast as he has completed five Ironman triathlons 29 marathons and a 100 mile ultra marathon run. He and his brother runs at least one marathon together each year, laughing the whole way through. Introducing to you the crazy outperformer that will help you outperform the norm, Scott. Well, welcome to the show, Scott. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay, Scott, what got you to start outperforming the norm? Yeah, I get, I get asked that question a lot. And, you know, it's not. I didn't have one, I would say, kind of eureka defining moment in my life that necessarily did it where I did a complete 180. Um, and I know some people have those stories, but mine was more of a, I think, just a gradual build over time uh, to be able to get to where I am today. And I guess if I were to really trace it back and to look at it, one thing that I vividly remember is I, I wasn't a very strong student academically. Um, I kind of had the mindset, I had the self-limiting belief that I just thought that I wasn't very smart. And going through school, I tried hard athletically because for whatever reason, I, I believed that I was a great athlete. Uh, but, but I thought that no matter what I did, it wasn't really going to matter in terms of grades and what happened with my life. So I just vividly remember waking up one morning after my junior year of college at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I was paying my way through college. And I was getting C's and, and D's and I was just, I was an average student. And I just remember, you know, we all have defining moments in our lives and we don't necessarily know when they're happening at the time, but things that we can look back on and we say, wow, my life really could have went in two different directions at that point in time. And I just remember waking up that morning and just thinking, you know what, Scott, you're paid a lot of money to be average. Like you're, you're paid a lot of money to be just like everybody else and you should really try harder you should really demand more of yourself not that i wanted to beat or outperform anybody else but just that i wanted to do better than i was doing and and once i told myself that i started applying myself a little bit more started getting a little bit better grades that improved my confidence went on to grad school got almost straight a's and then kind of from there, you know, went into doing some different things in business and eventually launching my own business and writing books and speaking on stages and coaching. And, and I look back at that day as kind of the one little snowball, let's say, that just started rolling forward a little bit. And I think from there, it's just it's gained some steam and it's just helped to sustain itself. So that's really how I got going. Okay. And how the question is. How did you come up with the concept of outperforming the norm? Well, outperforming the norm is different for every single person listening to this. I mean, it really is. And I think the first step is, like, if you were to take me back, um, you know, I just turned 40 years young. So if you were to take me back, let's say 15 or 20 <laughs> years ago, you know, the younger, probably cockier version of Scott would have just told you what you need to do to outperform. Like, if you do these things, you're an outperformer personally, professionally, athletically, or otherwise. And I, I don't look at it like that anymore. It's not my place to tell you what outperforming the norm is. Really, I put the question back on you and I say, what would it mean for you to outperform? And what would it mean for you to fall asleep at night knowing that you're doing your very best, that 
you're not only high achieving in whatever area that you want to be, but you're also fulfilled while you're doing it. And you just fall asleep at, at night knowing that you have some level of peace um, that you're making your most of, you know, the limited days that we have on this planet. So I think the first step to outperforming the norm is really just defining what does it mean to me to outperform? That's really, really great. And then in one of your videos, when you talk about outperforming, you mentioned that there's a price of admission to pay for every one of us. So what is the price of admission for outperformers? Yes, that, that actually goes back to my favorite. Uh, it's a longer quote, but it's called the price of admission. And there, there's a price of admission attached to everything that we want to achieve or we want to accomplish in our lives. And the easiest way that I can probably to, to just give a metaphor in or, or an analogy is like if you were to walk into a store, let's just say that you want to buy something like a material something there's going to be a price tag on that. And the price tag represents what you are going to have, the cost of it or what you are going to have to pay to acquire whatever it is that you want. And when I teed up kind of the, what does it mean to you to outperform? What, what, how would you define outperforming in your life? When we look at the price of admission, there is a price attached to whatever you want to achieve or accomplish in life, personally, professionally, athletically. If you want to run a marathon, there's a price of admission. If you want to write a book, there's a price of admission. Build a business, price of admission. Have a successful relationship, price of admission. And that price of admission is the discipline and the dedication and the sacrifices that are necessary to be able to achieve or accomplish whatever it is that you want. And I think the loftier the goal, the higher the price of admission. And for all the coaching clients that I've had and the people that I work with, it's, okay, what does it mean to you to outperform? And then you come back, you tell me, well, I want to build a million dollar business. Okay, well, the price of admission for that might be that you have to show up earlier, you have to stay later, you know, you have to be willing to really courageously put yourself out there and knowing that, you know, some people will love you, but others probably won't. Um, there are some discipline and dedication and sacrifices that go into that. And you have to be honest with yourself in if you have a goal or something out there that you want to achieve or accomplish, are you willing to pay that price of admission that is required for you to be able to achieve or accomplish what it is that you say you want. And quite honestly, it's, it's okay to actually look at it. And once you, once you decide what it is that you want, if you look at really what you're going to have to give up or what you're going to have to do to get it, it is okay to actually revise that and to say, you know what, Scott, I'm not willing to be like, I, I've got a family. I'm not willing to be the person that shows up first and leaves last for the first couple of years to build a business because I'm just not at that place in my life. And if you say that to yourself, that's fine. But what I've found is the people that really struggle are the ones that are kind of incongruent where they say they want this, but they're not willing to do that, that it takes to get it. You know, sometimes I'll say everybody wants the gold medal, but not a lot of people want to train like an Olympian. It's, it's really kind of that. So I, I think there's, to recap, there's a price of admission tied to everything you want to achieve or that you want to accomplish. If you are trying to do something that you've never done and you don't exactly know what the price of admission is, ask somebody that's done it before. I've done this in all areas of my business. When I was building my speaking business, I talked to other speakers. What am I going to have to do to build this area of my business? When I was trying to write my first book, Outperform the Norm. I asked other people, what, what do I need to do to write a book? Like, how do I make this happen? And so on and so forth. I did it in running a marathon and a hundred miles and everything else. Ask other people and then they will tell you. And then it comes back to the same thing that I said before. Just ask yourself, am I willing to pay this price of admission that is required to be able to achieve or accomplish whatever it is that I want? I'm very interested in the point where you raise up, like, how do I run a marathon? Or how do I even run a 100-mile ultra marathon, right? Now, walk me through that whole process of knowing what that price of admission is, and you still willingly put yourself forward to go and run that marathon. Because 
I, I guess like 90% of us or even more than that won't even won't, won't ever run a marathon in their life. So talk us through that whole process and the price of admission through that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I could come at that a few different ways. Like if we're talking about a physical endeavor, like running a marathon or running 100 miles, uh, you know that the price of admission for that is going to be you you are going to have to run a certain number of days per week, probably five or six days per week. And it's no different than anything else. Like it's no different than maybe some of the things that we go through business wise. Like I, you know, I think, I think one of the biggest cliche lines that I hear out there is like, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, something to that effect there are going to be days where you might necessarily not love what you do. Like, it's just going to feel hard. It's just, you're not necessarily going to want to do it. It's going to feel like more of a struggle. So I think the price of admission when you're talking about something like a marathon or, or an ultra marathon is just knowing, okay, for a period of three to four months leading up to this race, I'm going to have to run not only when I feel like doing it, but when I don't feel like doing it. And I need to show up and I need to put in the time because that preparation breeds familiarity and the familiarity breeds, breeds confidence and the confidence breeds success. So I have to be willing to show up and to put in that time beforehand if I'm going to want the payoff on race day. Um, so that's kind of the physical part of it. And then there's obviously the sleep, the nutrition, the different things like that. And just knowing that you're going to be tired from putting in a certain number of miles, but um, you know, that, that's more or less the price of admission for, for a marathon or for an ultra anyway. And how about like in terms of like your mentality, what was the price of admission to pay when it comes to building up that uh, mindset of, okay, I'm going to run and going to finish this uh, marathon or even that 100 mile ultra marathon? Yeah, if we're talking about during the actual race, um, you know, I oftentimes will tell people, I think one of my greatest motivators actually stems from anti-regret. Like, I just, I don't want to look in the mirror and I don't want to say to myself, well, I wish I would have tried this or I wish I would have done that. I mean, what really, at the end of the day, what's the worst thing that can happen? I mean, sometimes people will get the, they'll get the mentality when they're thinking about trying something really big and bold, whether it's running a hundred miles or writing a book or building a business or anything else. And they'll get in their head that like the failure of that is such a monumental failure that they won't be able to bounce back from. And if it doesn't work out, what's the big deal? Well, at least you tried it and it didn't work out. And isn't that better than having the little bit of regret in the back of your mind saying, I wish I would have at least given that a shot. So that's one of the things that kind of gets me to actually sign up and, to, you know, try to put my best foot forward in regards to some of these things. And, and quite honestly, when I'm out there racing, one of the, one of the things I try to remind myself of is just when I get done with the race, I just never want to look in the mirror wondering and wishing that I would have tried harder than I did. I just want to leave it all out there. And whether I do well or whether I don't do well, whether I finish or whether I don't finish, I don't want to answer that question with, I didn't try as hard as I could have tried, which to me would take me all the way back to probably prior to my junior year, when I talked about it at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, it would have taken me back to a time where I just really didn't try, apply myself very much and I didn't try very hard. I just, I don't want to be faced with that. So that's how I do it. Now, so for you, it's more of like what you say, anti-regret, right? You don't want to go, you don't want to like, you don't want to face yourself in the mirror and tell yourself that, you know, I didn't do my best um, back then. So it's really interesting in that perspective. Um, what are some of the habits that separates out performers and the average? Yeah, uh, there can be a lot. I mean, from, from the people that I've experienced and the people that I've personally worked with, I think it's, it's sometimes why I don't like always the term peak performance. Because to me, when you hear peak performance, it almost is like, okay, well, you have peak performance, but what's on the other side of peak performance? It almost you know, it, it almost encapsulates that there's also a valley in regards to that. Like you might be at the peak one time, but then you're also dipping down. So I, I think 
to look at how people outperform and actually look at sustained high performance. Believe it or not, I think a lot of that actually stems from just how you take care of yourself personally. I think how you take care of your health, uh, your exercise, your stress, your nutrition, your hydration, your sleep. I think all those things really matter because I think it is really, really hard, if not impossible, to be your best professionally for a sustained, really long period of time if you're not taking care of yourself. So I almost feel like that has to be an initial pillar and it kind of has to start there. And then beyond that, I think if we're talking about high performance habits as far as what people do maybe professionally, I think they're fantastic at, at identifying the things that matter. They're not the people that say, you know, you ask, hey, how are you doing? And they'll say, well, I'm really busy, like really, really busy. And sometimes when people will say that to me, I'll say, okay, I get that you're busy. Are you productive? Because it's a different question. Here in the States, especially, we're almost consumed sometimes with busyness. Like I just do a lot of stuff throughout the course of the day. And stuff is not what will allow you to outperform productivity is actually doing the right things and doing the things right. And sometimes it's saying no to things that you know that you shouldn't be doing. And other times it's really just single-mindedly focusing on the things that really matter as far as running your race, writing your book, building your business, having a great relationship, whatever, you know, peak health, whatever it happens to be for you. But outperformers are great at really focusing single-mindedly on the things that matter and disciplining themselves to do those things and to do them well. And then if they do some of these other things that may be quote unquote, the busy work, well, that's fine, but they will never miss the things that really are the needle movers and the things that really matter. Okay. Since you've interviewed numerous our performers right now, what are the top three greatest beliefs an outperformer can have? Just like I talk about habits, now I talk about the beliefs. Well, I think the first belief is that they don't have self-limiting beliefs, you know, and um, they, they don't put, I will always just say self-limiting beliefs are the governor on your individual potential. In other words, it's just self-limiting beliefs, the greatest opponent we will ever face is ourselves. And for everybody listening to this right now, I have no idea if you have any aspirations of running a marathon or an ultra marathon or writing a book or building a business, but chances are there's a part of you that's thought about doing something great. You've probably thought about living your own legacy and what that might mean. And a lot of times we want to look out at other people and we want to say, well, I can't do what they do. You know, sort of like what I used to say to myself back in my early school days where I used to say, well, I'm just not smart. And the fact of the matter is whatever it is that you would like to do or what you would like to achieve or accomplish, chances are there's someone that is no more educated, no more experienced, you know, no, no better than you in any specific area that has done exactly what it is that you're looking to do. And if they can do it, you can do it too. So don't put self-limiting beliefs on yourself. Uh, beyond that, I would say attitude of gratitude. Instead of thinking about um, what's going on with me, think about what I can do for we, or in other words, be driven by a sense of contribution and a sense of how can I be the best version of myself to be able to go out there and to be able to serve others. It's a different mentality and a different lens with which we look at the world. Now, just want to stop you right there. Um, yeah. That's very interesting, that point that come out before we move on to the third belief. So you explained just now about doing what's best for yourself and then doing what's best for others. Now, that's actually very interesting because usually people say, okay, uh, be at your best version. And usually when we say, oh, be our best version, we'll, do, we'll most likely do things that are good for us, right? Anything that gets us to the next level, we'll do it, right? But then you choose to go with the perception of do what's best for others. Now, walk us through that how that works and why that is important? Well, you know, my latest I'll perform the norm book was on leadership. So I'm just, I'm a huge believer in servant leadership. You know, I think that we were put here on the planet to serve others. And I think to 
to think about showing up as the best version of ourselves so we can contribute to others, I just think is a very powerful way to look at things. And I, I think it was Tony Robbins that I heard maybe say a, a long time ago, uh, when you're suffering, your energy or your attention is almost focused too much inward. Like it's focused on all I'm thinking about is what is going on with me rather than thinking about perhaps what's going on with we or what's going on with everybody else. So it's something that I just, I try to catch myself on a little bit. If, you know, I feel like I'm having a really negative day or I feel like I'm really struggling with something, chances are I'm kind of playing the woe is me saying, why me? Why is all this happening to me? Rather than what can I potentially learn from this and, and how can I use it to be able to just benefit others in some way, shape, or form. Okay, and then what's your third belief um, that our performers usually have? Yeah, a third one would probably be there is no failure, there's only feedback. Um, there's a distinct difference in the way outperformers look at quote unquote failure versus the norm. Because actually, outperformers don't look at failure as failure, they do actually look at it as feedback. And if you go out there, Again, if you try to run 100 miles, try to build a business, try to write a book, try to start a podcast, whatever it happens to be, and it doesn't work out, well, the way all performers look at it is they actually say, okay, this might not have worked out, but I got a valuable piece of feedback. And as long as I listen to that feedback and I learn from it, that's actually leading me one step closer to success. You know, I truly believe the only way that you can ever fail at something is if you make a mistake and you don't learn anything from it. Otherwise, we're all just on this journey where we're making mistakes and we're trying to learn as we go along. And all of those mistakes and those things that we are learning throughout this process should be leading us one step closer to success. And that fear of failure and that dichotomy of success and failure is a lot of times what really puts, keeps us from putting ourselves out there and from trying big things because we see it as the dichotomy of success or failure versus looking at it and like, I hope that I'm successful, but if I'm not, I'm going to get some great feedback that I can use in some way, shape or form to make me better the next time around. Okay, and now we're talking about feedback, right? You say that better inputs produce better performance outputs. I really, really, really love that uh, concept because it's just so concise and it pretty much says the point of it. Do walk us through and explain to us um, what that statement actually means. Yeah, inputs absolutely affect outputs. And I, I will oftentimes say you condition the mind like you condition the body. Like the same way that you won't get fit from maybe working out one time, uh, you don't necessarily get like a positive mindset, let's say, from just thinking positively one time. These things stack up over time and affect our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions. And when I talk about how these inputs and how we need to manage inputs to affect our performance outputs, I don't think a lot of people, and particularly the norm, is very in tune with just the, the reactive or kind of the passive inputs that, I have, that they have on a day-to-day -day basis and how it affects the way that they think and feel and perform. You know, and at the time that we're recording this podcast, I mean, we're, we're still in the heart of, at least here, you know, a lot of what's going on with COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Um, there's been, I'm recording this from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and there's been huge unrest with George Floyd and, you know, racial injustice and everything that's gone into that. And quite honestly, if you flip on the media at any point in time, it's just a lot more negative than it is positive. And if you put that, that input into your mind, I think, especially early on in the day, like one of the worst things I think a lot of people can do is like you wake up and you put on the news or you just start scrolling through social media, maybe and you see some of these things. And it doesn't really matter if it's you or me or the Dalai Lama, like if, if you get these things and you have these inputs coming in early on and repeatedly, it is going to affect your outputs in terms of how you think, how you feel, how you behave, the results you get from that. So I'm not saying that 
You know, you can never listen to the media, read the newspaper, you know, scroll social media or anything else. But just be in tune with when I do these things, how are these inputs actually affecting the way that I think and feel and perform? Okay, that, that really, really, um, that's really very interesting to take note of because most people would just consume, right? We usually consume on a day-to-day -day basis and we don't really care about so much about what we consume. And so this whole point is really notice, noticing and being aware of what you're actually taking in because it affects what you're giving out as well. And, and if I could say one thing on that too, just, just be very intentional and proactive on putting something good into your brain. Like this podcast that we're doing right now and what you're doing for people, like is you can listen to this and you can consume so much information now for free from tremendously inspirational, impactful outperformers that are trying to help you be better. And, uh, you know, if, if podcasts aren't your thing, then that's fine. Watch a TED Talk or, you know, re read a good article on, on a site that you like. But do something intentional and proactive to put good inputs into your brain every single day. And it's the type of thing that you probably won't notice it in a day. You might not even notice it in a week. You'll start to notice it in a month. But then over the course of months and years, it will completely change your mindset and therefore your feelings, your behaviors, your results, and your lifestyle. Okay, so you said that you are intentional with what you put inside um, yourself, right? Can you walk us through like what exactly do you do at the start of the day to prime yourself to get great inputs so you can get greater outputs throughout the day? Yeah, so I mean, I mentioned that I turned forty years young, uh, just Always young. about yeah, about about two months ago, and and maybe I've just done too many races. Who knows? But I can tell that my body has has gotten a lot more stiff as I'm aging right now. So I do like to actually wake up first thing in the morning and to do probably. I would call it on an average about twenty minutes of stretching, um, just to get my body loosened up to kind of get my mind right. And usually that is the time during the 20 minutes that I'll flip on a podcast, um, I'll flip on a TED talk, or I, I will just listen or I will watch something as I'm stretching. So I'm kind of getting the mind part of it as well as getting the body part of it. And to me, that's a good enough kickstart for whatever it is that I'm going to do. For a lot of people, what I hear is, you know, whether they're riding some form of, you know, subway, mass transit, or just a commute where they're commuting into work, um, they will use that time to listen to a podcast, to an audio book, to something like that, um, again, to kind of get their mind right as the day gets started. Okay, great. Just one of my last few questions. You've ran so many crazy marathons, right? And you said that um, every year you laugh with your brother throughout marathons. So that's a very interesting perspective because I think I'll be like sweating and just be breathless throughout the whole thing. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> Do, 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 do explain to us what you mean by laughing with your brother along marathons. Well, uh, trust me, it's, it's still a hard experience and, and I'm sweating plenty and it's, it's still really hard for me. Um, but whenever I'm running races by myself, it's, you know, if you haven't gotten this by now, like I'm a pretty competitive guy. I'm always trying my best when I'm doing races. But when I'm doing these races with my brother, it's, it's more of just a brotherly bonding experience um, where I just appreciate the time that I'm out there with him. And, you know, it's, it's just the type of thing that, you know, you're out there for a marathon roughly for the pace that we run at maybe three and a half to four hours. Um, and we just tell stories. He lives in Rome, Italy, and, and I obviously live here in the States. So I don't see him more than probably a couple times a year now. So it's just, it's been a fun brotherly bonding experience, something that we can look at and we can enjoy. And, and we just try to have a lot of fun with it. It's not, it's not about the competition. It's just about having fun. Well, that's, that's actually quite crazy. Now that, now, now that you tell me that you tell stories, even, I don't even think if I would have breath to like, say like, Hey, here's how my life has been going. <laughs> I don't think I will be able to run and then still go, I'm going to share with you my story. I'll just, I'll just probably be like, oh my God, when is this going to finish? 
Well, we, we talk a lot more early on. Like there's, there's a lot of talking early in the race when you're feeling better. And I would say probably the last, let's say six, six to eight miles, there's not a lot of talking going on. We're, we're both ready to be done and then talk when we're across the finish line. Okay, great. Um, before I ask my last question, where can we connect and learn more from you, especially outperforming the norm? Yeah, so the best place would probably be to just go to scottwelly.com. Uh, that's S-C-O-T-T-W-E-L-L-E.com. Uh, go ahead, follow me on social media, basically Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. All of those are just at Scott Welly. Again, S-C-O-T-T-W-E-L-L-E. Um, I would love to if some of your people would check out my books. You know, I've got lots of great bonuses that go with all of them. And I've, I've got eight different outperform books out there in a variety of areas. Them, all the links in the description. Yeah. Yeah. From leadership to sales, to just general health, happiness, high performance. There's one on running, there's one on triathlon. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of good information out there. I really try to just put, put a lot of good info out there. That's either for a very small fee or just completely free. So I would love it if people would check it out. Okay, great. And so the last question is, what is the legacy you want to live in this world? You know, that, that is a fantastic question. Um, you know what, I mean, so I always looked at legacy as what is the impact that you're having in the time that you're here? What are people going to say about you after you're gone? Um, and I think when I look at, and I'm a lot more in touch with it now than I think I used to be. And when I look at what is the legacy that I would like to leave, I just hope that, that people say that I'm someone that just based on my personality, maybe didn't always tell them what they wanted to hear, but told them what they needed to hear. And, and uh, I mean, in other words, I, I challenged them, challenged them to grow, challenged them to be better, hopefully not in a bad way, but just inspired some people to maybe reach for, for bigger and better and bolder, um, to challenge their own self-limiting beliefs, to not look at failure as failure, to look at it as feedback, um, to have an attitude of gratitude and just make the most of their precious time that we have here on the planet. So I'm just hoping that they look at me and, and say that, you know, he's someone that tried to pull other people up. Sometimes say you get on an elevator with someone and you can either take them up or you can take them down. I'm just hoping that, I'm someone that when I, whether I walk in a room, get on a stage, you know, get on a podcast with you and I get on an elevator with you, I'm hoping that I leave you at a higher level or I take you up to somewhere higher and better than you were when we first started. That's my greatest hope. I agree. So for all those people who want to know more about this crazy challenger and outperformer, go to his website and he has tons of books and he has tons of programs as well. That's something you want to check out when it comes to outperforming for athletes, whether you are um, in business or in organization or in teams as well. He's pretty much got it all covered for you. So thanks for, have, thanks for being on the podcast, Scott. And for those who are looking to really outperform, Scott is your man over here. Until the next time, start living your own legacy. Thank you very much.